Welcome folks, this is Tony from the A Minute to Midnight team bringing you the sixth video in the series on the New World Order in 2018 and this should be the last video in the series. There's a lot to cover in it. I hope that you'll find it helpful and useful and don't forget to check out the earlier videos as well in the series if you haven't already done so. Previously in this series I've mentioned the term as above so below. I've also mentioned Alice A. Bailey and her teachings and the Luciferians. I want to tie some of that together in this video here. I also want to show you how Christians are being influenced and affected by this many times without even knowing and also that there is a deliberate agenda to do that. So first off, the saying, as above so below, where did it come from? Well, it actually comes from the Emerald Tablet. And you may sometimes hear of Emerald Tablets plural being spoken of rather than just an Emerald Tablet singular. This can be confusing if you're unaware of where it stems from. The so-called Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean should not be confused with the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. The first claim for multiple Emerald Tablets dates back only to the early mid 20th century and it can be attributed to a Dr. Morris Doriel and I will look at that shortly. However, the claim for the existence of an original Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus is much older. There are some that believe the Emerald Tablet to be up to 38,000 years old. However, the earliest documentable sources date back only to the 8th century AD. In other words, there's no actual proof that it is any older than the 8th century and no one has been able to prove that there ever was an actual Emerald Tablet. However, if one believes the legends, the Emerald Tablet was supposedly discovered in a caved tomb in the hands of the corpse of Hermes Trismegistus who sat on a golden throne. Who the purported discoverer was depends on which legend you follow. Some say Sarah, the wife of Abraham, others Moses' wife Miriam and she supposedly placed them in the Ark of the Covenant, or Apollonius of Tyana. Some legends claim that the Emerald Tablet was written by Adam and Eve's son Seth. Another legend claims that it was written by Thoth from Atlantis in 36,000 BCE. It has had a significant influence on alchemy for many centuries and also forms a sort of cornerstone of the philosophies of the occult. The Emerald Tablet, if it ever existed, is said to have been made of emerald or green stone and it is supposed to contain the secrets of the universe inscribed upon it. Isaac Newton actually did a translation of it too, by the way. Now, as far as the existence of the Emerald Tablets, plural, goes, let's look at the history briefly. A neo-theosophist named Morris Doriel, whose real name was Claude Doggins, is the author of the supposed Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean. Often attempts are made to have these palmed off as genuine ancient texts from Atlantis by various occult groups. Doriel claimed that he found these 12 tablets in the Great Pyramid in 1925. He supposedly translated them and then subsequently they were published in the late 1930s and early 1940s. Doriel was the founder of a cult called the Brotherhood of the White Temple. He founded it in 1930 and the cult calls itself a metaphysical church. You can find that on their website. Doriel was supposedly authorised by the Great White Lodge to retrieve the Emerald Tablets, which are now purported to be hidden in a secret chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza, again according to the Brotherhood of the White Temple's website. It's important here that you don't confuse the Brotherhood of the Great White Lodge with the Brotherhood of the White Temple. The White Temple was founded by Doriel, whereas the Great White Brotherhood or Great White Lodge, in the belief of many occultists and New Age practitioners, is allegedly a body of ascended masters or masters of ancient wisdom who watch over the earth and humanity. 
These occultists believe that the Ascended Masters are immortal mystics who carry on influencing humanity after their physical deaths. However, as Christians we should be aware that they are in fact demonic beings or fallen angels. See, they would put Jesus in the category of an Ascended Master and the same as Buddha and Muhammad and various others and and a bunch of other fancy names like... uh, the ones that have influenced the writers like Alice A. Bailey and Blavatsky and Alistair Crowley, etc. Okay, now getting back to the phrase, as above, so below, we can see this in the writings of occultist and New Age proponent Alice A. Bailey. Here's a couple of quotes. Firstly, she states, Conformation or the power to conform to the pattern set in the heavens and to produce below that which is above and that's found in her book Esoteric Psychology A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 1 Also if you read further in another book called The Externalization of the Hierarchy listen to this one Alice A. Bailey said I have earlier told you that the five masters concerned with the initial stages of the organization of the hierarchy on earth are the master K.H. The Master Moraya, the Master R, the Master who started the labour movement in the modern world, and myself, the so-called Master DK. Remember, Alice A. Bailey is supposedly channeling the Master DK to write this. So this is why when she says myself, the so-called Master DK, it's because she's supposedly channeling him, okay? I'll carry on. The division of labour is here of great interest. In my June message for 1948, I referred to the five specialised energies which were at the time released to carry forward their impersonal task. Each of these energies is concerned with the desired organisation, for it must ever be remembered that through the organisation which we are considering is concerned with the interior or subjective work of the hierarchy, the repercussions and resultant effects will take place on earth with physical plane effects because the old occult truism as above so below will be rapidly and objectively demonstrated. The result and the effects produced will constitute one of the modes whereby the hierarchy will prove its factual presence on earth. Now remember the hierarchy is a spiritual hierarchy of these ascended masters. That's who is being spoken of here by Bailey or the Master DK through Alice A. Bailey. So we can see it's absolutely occult, okay? You'll find many, many other mentions of As Above, So Below in the works of occultists. Okay, so now that we've established it's an occult term, the Message Bible uses the term As Above, So Below in its rendition of the Lord's Prayer. Matt S. of A Minute to Midnight did a great article on this a while ago. It's worth checking that out. Most of us know the Lord's Prayer as saying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But that's not what the Message Bible says. The Message Bible says, Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are, set the world right, do what's best, as above, so below. So, wow. Why is as above, so below in the Message Bible? I'll tell you why. Because I believe the Message Bible is a deliberate New Age distortion of the Bible and is bringing everyone into the oneness religion of the New World Order. It's not by chance. It's deliberate. And there are many other things in the Message Bible that point to this New Age message. But just here's a few others, okay? The word Lord is found 7,970 times in the King James Bible, yet it is only found 71 times in the Message Bible. That's a heck of a lot of difference from 7,970 to only 71. And we've already seen how occultists and New Ages use the term Ascended Masters. It's crucial and critical part of their terminology. They put Jesus into this category too, remember? Now in the light of that, let's look at how the Message Bible speaks of Jesus. Jesus is called Master more than 400 times in the Message Bible. But even worse, the term Master Jesus 
is found 76 times in there. After looking at how occultists view Ascended Masters, look at this translation of the stoning of Stephen that is found in Acts chapter 7, verse 59 and 60. As the rocks rained down, Stephen prayed, Master Jesus, take my life. Then he knelt down praying loud enough for everyone to hear, Master, don't blame them for this sin. His last words, then he died. See, it's very subtle, but it is introducing people to the New Age concept of Ascended Masters. There are many, many more examples I could give about the Message Bible, but that's just one way that the occultists and New Ages have infiltrated Christianity through these watered-down translations, and the Message is one of the worst. Now I want to draw your attention to another article that Matt S. wrote on our minutetomidnight.com website. It's called Heaven on Earth. Does Heaven Invade Earth? Now... This is interesting because uh, Matt very rightly points out that there is a theme that's kind of invading Christianity about heaven coming down to earth. In Matt's words, to give you an idea of how this theme of heaven invading earth comes about, here are some pointers. Bill Johnson of Bethel Church in Reading, California wrote a book called When Heaven Invades Earth around 2005. Chris Vallotton, also of Bethel Church, wrote a book a few years later called How Heaven Invades Earth. Both books are highly popular bestsellers. There are catchy songs like the song Spirit Breakout by William McDowell but taken up by Kim Walker of Bethel's very own Jesus Culture and the lyrics in Spirit Breakout uh, a sound of heaven touching earth, a sound of heaven touching earth, spirit break out, heaven come down. Now, this is quietly slipping into our thinking in the church. It kind of sounds like, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. However, Matt points out, has Jesus already brought his kingdom to earth or is that a future event? And where is the kingdom of God? Luke tells us that Jesus spoke to the Pharisees when they questioned him on this and he said, Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. So has Jesus already brought his kingdom to earth? Well, Matt says, My belief is yes and no. He, that's Jesus, is not yet ruling and reigning on earth, but there is Bible evidence to support something of God's kingdom being here. Because Matthew 6.33 tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But this is clearly different from what the dominionists or the seven mountains mandate people are saying. And we're going to get into that a little bit because I believe that is also the Seven Mountains Dominionist theology is leading us towards the end times global religion and the reign of the Antichrist. Jesus has not fully established his kingdom on earth because the earth is currently ruled by Satan. So this kind of kingdom now and dominionist theology has it wrong. We are not call to somehow usher in God's kingdom on earth before Jesus returns, actually that fits more in line with New Age philosophy, the belief of the New World Order crowd. We've already looked at some of Alice Bailey and the, the Illuminus and the Lucius Trust, some quotes of them in a previous video. Remember, in Esoteric Psychology Volume 2, Alice Bailey said on page 337, the New World Religion which is that of the kingdom of God is definitely upon the way. So that's contrary to what Jesus said, because in John 18, 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. In John 16, 11, Jesus said, And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged, and then in 1 John 5, 19, it says, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So how is fallen man supposed to take back the kingdom of Satan? 
We are told that he is the ruler of this world. The Great Commission was to preach the gospel and win souls for Christ. So where do the Dominionists get the mandate to take back the earth from Satan? We read in Revelation chapter 13 that the beast and the false prophet have dominion for a time. Plus, there's nowhere that I can find in the New Testament where Christians sought to turn secular business world upside down and creating some sort of seven mountains mandate. They turn the world upside down in a spiritual sense by preaching the gospel. But aside from John, they were all killed by the secular authorities and John was made a prisoner on the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation as well. So we have these seven mountains... Uh, theology, which is part of the Nah movement and the Dominionist movement, where they're looking for these the control kind of of seven th- seven different things. If you look at the list of the seven mountains from Lauren Cunningham in 1975, he said number one home, number two the church, number three schools, number four government and politics, number five the media, number six arts, entertainment and sports. Number seven, commerce, science and technology. Or today we might often see it referred to as number one, the family. Number two, religion. Number three, education. Number four, business. Number five, government. Number six, media. And number seven, art. The the Seven Mountains theology kind of disappeared for a while, but it it re-emerged about the year 2000 through a guy called Lance Wall now. And incidentally, remember, it was Lance Woolnow who wrote the book called God's Chaos Candidate, Donald J. Trump and the American Unraveling. He's the first guy that called Donald Trump a wrecking ball uh, and that he was King Cyrus type of thing. So when you realise that Woolnow is a uh, Seven Mountains Dominionist, you should have some warning signs there, I believe anyway. Essentially, in a nutshell, Dominionists have a belief that an elite army of overcomers will overcome the enemies of Jesus and gain power and authority through the earth. The world's government will be upon their shoulders and when all the secular authorities and governments have finally submitted to them, Christ will return. Then they can present the kingdom to him. One big problem I see with this, apart from the fact that it is not biblical, is that it means having a pyramid type structure. Where the Nah prophets and apostles and the political leaders and the leaders in the other seven mountains fields with their grandiose ideas will be at the top of a pyramid and the rest of humanity will kind of be subservient to them in a way. That's a perfect place for narcissists and people who, who are, have exaggerated self-importance and like to lord it over others. In fact, I have in front of me a picture that is an advert for a Spring 2019 Seven Mountains Culture Shapers Summit. Mobilising Strategic Reformation, it says. And the logo is shaped like a pyramid. Yes, it could be said that it's a mountain, but it looks a lot like a pyramid. Great Reformation is beginning with the Seven Mountains. You guys are going to notice he's going to be teaching more on that. But if you're in the underground, you want to get to our Orlando conference uh, for mobilizing intercession, prophetic and activism, political engagement. And this is for like the frontline warriors. Um, now, this is, now the underground has a $520 discount to this uh, uh, next training and event we're going to do. It's only $777 for the underground. But listen. For those of you that aren't in the underground, get in the underground because we're only doing it for two more days, $520 discount to the conference. Um, Go to the 7munderground.com, just join it. It's only seven bucks a month and you get my inside political political perspective and prophetic um, activist training. Apostolic Hubs is, or Apostolic Centers is going to be the governmental, like Wilberforce had, the cohesive point where local communities of act of, of, of leaders in the seven mountains will come together because God's leading them to work together and the church is going to have to be the body of Christ in all seven mountains when is it? in Orlando so we even have fun so that you can have a little bit of Mickey Mouse in the midst of your warfare <laughs> you always have to blend a little Mickey Mouse with the spiritual warfare to keep your head balanced <laughs> among the people 
who embrace and preach New Apostolic Reformation theology or NAR theology, you won't hear of the rapture or the great apostasy or of the tribulation or the birth pangs mentioned in Matthew 24. The prosperity gospel or the dominionist belief system just doesn't fit with Matthew 24 or Luke 21 or the book of Revelation for that matter. Try and find a sermon, for example, by Kenneth Copeland talking about end times. I think you will struggle. But these people love to use terms like self-appointed apostle so-and-so or the prophet so-and-so or military general is often used to describe someone who's involved in a war or a revival of some kind. And you'll hear the word revival often used or great revival. Now, one of the proponents of this is Rick Joyner. This is from his own website. He says this, talking about his involvement with the Knights of Malta. Then I was shown that the Lord had preserved a remnant of true Knights of the OSJ, that's the Order of St. John, because they had a purpose in the last day battle between light and darkness. One day I actually prayed that, even though I have never desired earthly honours or titles, I would like to become one of these Knights. After this prayer, it seemed that hardly a month went by, and prophetic people began to say that they had seen me being knighted by the Lord. And later he also said this, That was all the confirmation I needed as I was reminded of the many words that I had received about being knighted. There's going to be a revival of a true order of knights that will restore honour and nobility and morality to the nations. But folks, where on earth does that fit in with scripture? I cannot find it in scripture. These people have a kind of a grandiose vision of themselves it would seem. But what I see is worse than that is that it becomes like who is, if we aren't called to usher in the kingdom for Jesus Christ first but these people are working towards trying to bring a kingdom together, whose kingdom is it ultimately going to be? We know that the Antichrist as I mentioned earlier will rule and he will be under Satan and so that's the kingdom I see arising in the end times not uh, the one that Rick Joyner is just talking about where the knights will restore honour and nobility and morality to the nations Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 17 in the Bible tell us that the Antichrist will have a religious, political and economic system that will cause all to worship the beast in its image or it will be death to defy any part of what is decreed by the Antichrist and his minions. This system and its leaders will persecute and kill the saints. Anyone having faith in Jesus and not in Satan will be marked for death. Satan will need a system that unifies as many people against God as he can. He will need a philosophy or ideology that seems right to people. Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And I'm suggesting that as above, so below, this theology is likely to be a very big part of that. This occult theology which has infiltrated the church and is essentially part of the dominionist theology. Remember in Luke Chapter 4, verse 5 and seven, five to 7, the temptations when the devil took Jesus on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you'll worship me, all will be yours. Uh, so Jesus would have pulled Satan up if that were not the truth. If the kingdoms did not belong to Satan, Jesus would have gone, hold on a minute, mate, that's actually not the truth. But he didn't. And then if we go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4, it says, So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? The power and authority is in the beast's kingdom. It's not in some church kingdom established on earth. 
We know that the Rockefeller family has been influential in establishing aspects of the New World Order. They're big players in it. J.D. Rockefeller promoted universal ecumenism by stating in December 1917, Would that I had the power to bring to your minds a vision as it unfolds before me. I see all denominational emphasis set aside. I see the church moulding the thought of the world as it has never done before. Uh, leading in all great movements as it should. I see it literally establishing the kingdom of God on earth. Now, the Federal Council of Churches was used routinely by the Rockefellers to further their personal interests in church circles, and Rockefeller donated to the Federal Council's Department of Church and Economic Life and promoted the concept of an international church. By the way, I haven't been able to find an original source for that comment by J.D. Rockefeller, but it is pretty widely reported that he said that. I know there will be people that aren't going to like what I'm about to say or my using the clips I'm about to play in a way that shows up the Dominionist agenda. I'm not wanting to come across as being anti-Trump or pro-Trump or anti the people like Mark Taylor and Rick Joyner as such either, but I think it's important that we point out when doctrine doesn't line up with scripture. And dominionism and the seven mountains theology, I don't believe does line up with scripture. And it's called Commander in Chief. And it says, the Spirit of God says, I've chosen this man, Donald Trump, for such a time as this. The Spirit of God says, the enemy will quake and shake and fear this man I have anointed. Yeah, in 2011, uh, Mark Taylor received a word while he was watching the news Trump was speaking, this man will be president. Great prosperity would come to the United States that would be paralleled by a spiritual awakening, by a spiritual prosperity. I do believe we're headed for unprecedented prosperity in America. And I've said that all along, if you've listened to everything I've said. And right now we are on course or getting on course, I believe for the greatest prosperity we have ever enjoyed as a nation, maybe that any nation has ever enjoyed. And the end result is the nations of the world are going to be prepared for the greatest move of God there will have ever been, the harvest that is the end of the age and the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom by power that represents the kingdom throughout the earth. That's where we are. That's where we're headed. It's going to be the seven mountains, you know, the media, uh, the marketplace. Home churches are starting to grow. I'm getting emails all the time. People are going to home churches now. That's where you're going to see the true power and authority come out. Let's do, I believe, some of these home churches that are going to become special ops groups, so to speak, because it's going to be guerrilla-style spiritual warfare. These small groups, God's going to download these blueprints, these spiritual special forces groups, and each group may have a different mission that they have to complete. Now, all of a sudden, we have a righteous president who's actually doing good and is stopping the New World Order timeline. Now, Bush 43 was crawling out of his hole, and he starts running his mouth. He says, the covenant that these five presidents have had with Baal is about to be broken, and that's what this is going to be a huge sign for. So two will be taken, three will be shaken. In other words, I believe two out of those three will probably end up with prison time for treasonous acts. And the third one will be, will be shaken as well. It's not judgment from God on America. This is a war. This is a spiritual battle between light and dark. Mark Taylor is right. It is a spiritual war for individuals to overcome the darkness. But Revelation 13, 7 says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So how does that fit in with Dominionist theology that the Antichrist is given power to overcome the saints rather than there being a Dominionist kingdom of the church in the end times? We've been told by Dominionist Seven Mountains theology Preachers like Rick Joyner, Mark Taylor, Lance Wall now and many others that Donald Trump is God's anointed and that he will make America great again and bring prosperity and we can't question Donald Trump because we're touching God's anointed. 
Now, as I mentioned, I don't want to get into being pro-Trump or anti-Trump. I'm simply addressing this issue of the evangelicals claiming that Donald Trump is God's specially anointed president. Now, is that the truth or is it simply people heaping up teachers to scratch their itching ears in the last days? We are living in the end times and rather than Christians taking over the media, we're seeing more and more Christians being censored by the media, including YouTube and Facebook, etc. And we are moving towards world government. And it won't be a Christian-based world government. Previously in some other videos I've mentioned the city of Neom that's being developed in Saudi Arabia, this futuristic smart city under Mohammed bin Salman. I want you to just take a look at the logo for Neom. Matt pointed this out to me, Matt from A Mint to Midnight, a couple of days ago. When you look at that logo, you probably don't notice it at first, but then look at what the shape of it actually is. It's a Baphomet symbol, the inverted pentagram. I'm not going to go into detail about Neom and its links to the Council on Foreign Relations etc in this video because I've covered it in other ones but you definitely want to watch Neom and its developments in 2018 and take note that Mark Taylor is telling us that Trump is against the new world order but if you look at the people that he surrounded himself with many of those are part of that new world order drive including Stephen Schwartzman, who is involved in NEOM. He is a longtime friend of Donald Trump's, and he is a member of the Skull and Bones, the same as the Bushes were. And so is the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States under Trump. Between February the 10th and February the 13th, 2018, there was the 6th World Government Summit held in the United Arab Emirates, which saw 4,000 delegates from around 130 countries attend. The official press release from the World Government Summit ended with a plea for institutions to realign with the New World Order. The list of speakers at the summit included World Bank President Jim Kim, World Economic Forum boss Klaus Schwab, International Monetary Fund boss Christine Lagarde, Goldie Horn, Deepak Chopra, Kenneth Colkier of The Economist Group, Becky Anderson of CNN and uh, representatives from Google and Facebook, and a lot of representatives from the Islamic world. I noticed that most of the topics on day one of the conference included the word happiness in it. So it was all about everyone being happy with this globalist New World Order agenda and a lot of transhumanism and that sort of thing. Artificial intelligence was covered as well as the Agenda 2030 initiatives. So folks, there is a big push towards world government and it certainly isn't a world government with Jesus Christ and Christians at the head. But the key place to watch in the end times is actually Jerusalem and what happens there. So we need to see what Donald Trump's going to do and what the administration under Trump is going to do as far as the peace plan goes and with the whole embassy move. Uh, what does this mean? We shall have to wait and see. But things do seem to be aligning with Bible prophecy and remember that Jerusalem is actually the geographical centre of end times Bible prophecy. Well folks, that's the last of the videos in this series. This is number six in the New World Order in 2018 series. Don't forget the most important thing is to get your focus on Jesus Christ and on God and on the gospel rather than on world events. Uh, there's so much more I could have put in this video, but at the end of the day, it comes down to our relationship with God is more important than what's going on in the world and with world government, etc. Uh, we would appreciate donations. A Minute to Midnight is run by donations. Thank you. If you can help us out, that'll be wonderful. You can find a donation button on our website through DonorBox on a minute to midnight.com. And I think that's about it for this series. Thank you for joining me, and don't forget to check out the earlier videos in the series. So, this is Tony signing out for the A Minute to Midnight team.